welcome to lecture four on public opinion. Measuring public opinion. Political leaders rely on public opinion polls. These are scientific instruments that are used to measure public opinion. Now, what do these polls do for the political leaders? Well, they, they help them decide whether to run for office, what policies to support, or how to vote on important legislation that their constituents back home um, have an opinion on. Pollsters generally rely on a sample of the population. Pollsters can't ask everybody in America what, oh, I'm sorry, what they believe, because by the time they got done with the poll, um, years would pass. So in other words, they want to uh, they want a sample, or it's a small group that's selected by the researchers to represent the most important characteristics of an entire population. Now, polling must meet certain requirements for it to be considered scientific or to even be considered accurate. Um, they need a simple random sample or what some people call a probability sample. This is a method used by pollsters to select a representative sample. Every individual in a population must have an equal probability of selected as a respondent. So, for instance, if I wanted to ask people what they thought of uh, Barack Obama, or no, so let's just say Joe Biden, um, and I only talk to people in Archer City, Texas. Now, that's going to be a very small sample because not many people live there. And traditionally, uh, they're going to be conservative Republicans. So the sample, or the, the the sample is not going to be representative of all of America. On the other hand, if I only talk to people in New York City and ask them what they thought of Donald Trump, that's not going to be a representative sample because they're going to be biased towards them. So that poll will be biased. So everybody in America has to have an equal opportunity to be selected for this poll. How do they guarantee that? They use something called random digit dialing. This basically just generates a random phone number and the respondents are selected from this list of people. Other things that are required to make sure that the sample is representative is this, the sample size. Normally, you don't want to see a, 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 a poll that samples less than 100 people. Anything under 120 people is not going to be scientific. The margin of error, or what they call the sampling error, is going to be larger. Uh, uh, it's going to be plus or minus, say, two or three percentage points. Any sampling error that you see on a poll that's greater than 4%, I would disregard that poll. Because normally samples use about a thousand people or 2,500 people and that ensures that you have a significant or sufficient uh, random people that are representative. You want an equal number of Republicans, an equal number of Democrats, an equal number of whatever uh, constituent group that you're looking at, but you basically want to get a snapshot of America. Because, you know, like I said, if you just talk to people in Archer City, you're going to get a biased result. If you just talk to people in New York, you're going to get a biased result. So the main error that most pollsters want to avoid is an unrepresentative sample. The most famous one that they talk about in the textbook is the one from the Literary Digest poll in 1936. That basically the magazine sent out... Uh, two million, or they 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 surveyed over two million people, chosen from their subscriber list, phone books, and car registrations. Even though the sample was big, it was unrepresentative of the population because not everybody had a phone, not everybody not everybody had a car during the Great Depression, and those who could tended to be Republican voters in greater numbers than those who weren't. As a result of this biased sample, the polls showed that Republican Alf Landon beating the actual winner, FDR. So the first question you should ask of a poll report 
is was the sample chosen scientifically? If the poll is a scientific one, then an effort has been made to either choose a sample randomly from the population or to weigh it in order to make it more representative of the general population. Reputable polling organizations always use scientific sample. However, many polls are unscientific, such as online polls that you take on a computer, telephone surveys in which you must call a certain number, or mail-in questionnaires in magazines that are sent to you by you know, charities, whatever. Such surveys suffer from the fault that the sample is self-selected. That is, you decide whether you wish to participate. Self-selected samples are not likely to be representative of the population for various reasons. The readers of a particular magazine or contributors to a specific charity are likely to differ from the rest of the population in other significant respects. Those who take the time and trouble to volunteer for a poll are more motivated than the average person and probably care more about the survey subject. Many such polls allow individuals to vote more than once, thus allowing the results to be skewed by people who stuff the ballot box. Because poll questions only sample, because polls question only a sample of the population, there's always a chance of drawing a sample that is unrepresentative. For instance, in a political poll, it's possible that a random sample of voters could consist entirely of Democrats. However, some extreme errors of the same kind are, are not so unlikely, and this means that every poll has some degree of imprecision or probability of being wrong because the sample may not be precisely representative of the population as a whole, there is a chance that the poll results will be off by a certain amount. Statisticians refer to this as the margin of error or sampling error. Proper survey de design must consider question wording because the reliability of the results can be affected by that question wording can generate measurement error. Survey questions must be worded precisely so they do not jeopardize the reliability of the survey results. Other things that can affect the reliability, the poor question format, a faulty ordering of questions, poor vocabulary, ambiguity of questions, questions with built-in biases, like, are you going to vote for that communist Democrat? Are you going to vote for that racist Republican? That's the kind of things that could basically bias your polling results. When polls are wrong, there's something called a social desirability effect. When respondents to a survey report what they expect the interviewer wishes to hear rather than what they believe, a lot of people attribute the social desirability effect to why the polls were so wrong in 2016 that basically everybody said that Hillary Clinton was going to win. But not a lot of people wanted to admit to total strangers on the phone or outside of the polling booth who they voted for because they felt like if they admitted that I voted for Trump, then the pollster would think that they were racist or whatever. And then there's, remember we talked about selection bias. This arises when the sample is not representative of the population being studied. It creates errors in over-representing or under-representing some opinions. Now the picture you see on the slide is a mis wouldn't a misprint, but because the Chicago Daily Tribune basically predicted that Dewey would defeat Truman. And the next day, Truman had a great laugh in showing everybody that newspaper because they were wrong. Now, there's other kinds of effects that can that are associated with polling. We call push polling and the bandwagoning effect. Push polling is a technique in which questions are designed to shape the respondents' opinion. So a push poll is not a scientific poll. They don't care about the results. They're only asking you questions to shape your opinion. Like, uh, do you know that this candidate beats his wife? Or do you know he likes to kick little dogs? 
or something like that. What do you think about this? And they're trying to shape your opinion poll, your opinion. And the most famous example occurred during the Republican primary uh, back in 2000 between Bush and uh, uh, John McCain. Now I'm running low on time, so I'm going to skip over the details. The other is the bandwagon effect. This is a shift in electoral support to the candidate the public opinion polls report as the front runner. Like the picture says, once a team is doing good, basically their supporters come out of the woodwork. You only want to support a winner, and this happens a lot. Because if the polls show that so and so is ahead by you know a certain amount of, of uh, percentage points, everybody wants to basically jump on that bandwagon and be seen as supporting a winner. Now, with this table from your textbook or from the new textbook, you can just see the overall polling errors that occurred since 1936 all the way to 2020. Um, and as you can see, let me get this. Um, the big one was in with Alf Land in 12% in 1936, but there were other significant ones 9% to Aldi Stevenson in 1952, where Eisenhower actually won by 10 points. Um, some of these are uh, easily explained by the polling. Uh, being within the margin of error. So anything about three points or 2.5 points is actually, you know, within the margin of error of every poll. Now, it's it's funny because they made the point of highlighting Hillary Clinton's name here in the third asterisk. They say she won the popular vote, but Donald Trump won the Electoral College. Well, yes, she did win the popular vote, and Al Gore won the popular vote in 2000, but the popular vote is not what matters in a presidential election. It's the state-by-state -state electoral vote. Okay, that's it. We're going to stop right there. And